and thank you very much for considering that this particular part of the day is worthy of your attention. Carl Marie Vinegar, Bill Fortune. It's all part of the process of launching this little effort that's been eight years, well, eight and a half years in the making and is involved. A tumultuous process. So, yeah, it, 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 the initial um, impression is obviously the occult battle of Britain is sort of something pretty dramatic, but it's not an Indiana Jones movie. We, we wish it was. We had this sense that we wanted to be a special effects extravaganza, that we want, you know, scared Nazis, we want Nazis with their faces melting off. We want all this kind of thing. It wasn't like that. And if you, you know, to go into the murky world of Nazi cultism on the internet, you'll find so much goddamn rubbish about the Thor Society. You get the sense of Dennis Wheatley, Black Magic, no, we know, a meeting of the Thor Society. This is the kind of stuff that's going down. It wasn't really like that at all. And we also have this sense of Deal of Fortune and uh, associates in London at Queensbury Terrace in 1940 that they're all kind of gearing up for some pretty serious stuff and then the Nazis get, send it all over and it, it, it gets pretty damn serious. But in fact, it wasn't really like that at all. If you're looking for some kind of, um, you know, movie representation of this whole scenario, incredibly enough, this is a bit more like it. <laughs> Bring on some road sticks. I, I challenge any of you to watch this movie now and not actually come to the conclusion that the actual event of the character is the unfortunate. And remember, for those of you who haven't seen it for a while, she's on the quest for the great star of Ashtaroth, and when she gets it all put together, she has the power, you know, to animate all of these kind of figures from the whole of British history to defend, you know, Britain against the stepping incursion from this Nazi U boat that's come on the shore and disrupted everything. And when I see it, you know, because I've watched it a few times in the last 20 years, when you see this stuff, I have to admit, I get pretty damn emotional about it. You know, it's a good name Disney film, but it's pretty effective. And yeah, this incredible image of, of, I don't know who was behind this movie, but I think they got a lot of stuff right. And come on now. Come on now, this, this, this is a, it's, it's far more like it than any of these other movies, right? And you've got the Bowman of Asian Core. You know, it's very, it's, it's very powerful. It has that kind of tone to it. And I've often wondered about this. It was written by all an American boy from Mary Norman, in Norway in 1943. I've tried to find out a bit more about it, what the background was, whether she could possibly have known about the deal of fortune left, left and so forth. I've never been able to find out enough to confidently state anything. But look, this is here, you know. But the truth of the matter is, when we think about the occult battle of Britain, what it really boils down to is a bunch of middle-aged and elderly people sitting down after their elevenses, you know, on a Sunday morning to sit there in their armchairs with their eyes closed and actually not fall asleep and try and see some pictures in their heads. You know, that's actually what was really physically happening. So it kind of sounds a bit ridiculous, a bit preposterous, bearing in mind that, you know, up in the sky at that time, young people of, of tremendous physical courage were putting their lives on the line in a very tangible physical sense. And yet there's still something about this whole scenario that has, you know, a tremendous resonance that nonetheless draws you in and, and certainly it's made me feel that there's something you know, very important about it uh, and something that, that is continually you know, renewing itself in terms of our understanding of it. Now probably like many people, this is where I started off decades ago. You know, the morning of the magicians and the horrifically dubious spirit of destiny. In my book I'm running an ongoing critique of Trevor Ravenscroft. There's something about the mood of that book that I think is important to, to kind of engage with, but boy oh boy does he ever get a lot of stuff wrong. But The Morning of Magicians, although it's full of a whole bunch of stories that in real terms are, are not true, the approach of the authors who were surrealists, you know, who had a sense that they were, they were 
creating what they termed a fantastic realism, that they were setting a mood, a way of perceiving and understanding something that was otherwise incomprehensible. I still think there's something great about that book. And this sense, the rise of Nazism was one of those rare moments in the history of our civilization where the door was noisily and ostentatiously opened onto something other, other. When I was first become a history nerd, when I was like, you know, 10 years old, and I watched, you know, lots of documentaries on the war and stuff, I really got that sense that there was this two different, completely different worlds, because this, this is the British culture of the 1930s, man. You know, when I was like a kid, that we still had Will Hyde and George Forby movies on TV, and I saw loads of them, and I kind of took the sensibilities and the mood of all of that in. And the representative figure of the time is Neville Chamberlain. You know, everything about him, uh, he just has a certain demeanour. You know, history has kind of damned him, he's very unfortunate for having been in that place at that time. But he is of a type, he is of a culture. And what have you got going on? On the other side, you got this for sake. Uh, you know, I remember when I was young, I used to see films of Nuremberg rallies that brought me out of goose peoples. What the, what the hell is going on here? And, and you know, the lady German mind was giving it plenty. This is, uh, this is another universe. This is something else altogether. And our experience is this legendary cathedral of light. I think it was in Francis King's Satan and Swastika, which is a bad title for a book, but it's, you know, the point that he makes. If this isn't a flipping cone of power, I don't know what the hell it is. You know, this, the, the, there is a, a mindset there that is extraordinarily unusual, and the economics arguments, the sociological arguments, the fact that, you know, at the end of the First World War, Germany's been not treated that well by the Treaty of Versailles, there's going to be an inevitable resurgence of an aggressive nationalism. Sure, yeah, there will be, but the strangeness and the severity of form that it took is outrageous. So of course in, in the 90s, this is my prime resource. Dear Fortune's uh, wartime letters as collected by Gareth Knight. Now Gareth Knight just did a few little notes. It wasn't really his remit about what was going on in the war at the same time as these letters, whereas I decided as a 1940 freak who uh, had a whole childhood full of seeing films like Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain and so on. I would try and run the history alongside it. So this is, is, is the climax and the centre of gravity of my book. And the old conceit that I did, and I, I, why I came to such a strange mindset, I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight, but I, I read these two classic works. You know, Nicholas Goodrick Clark was probably the first credible study in Nazi cultism over 30 years ago. I had this sense of these two groups of characters, the Glastonbury people that we've already talked about a little bit this morning in the opening ceremony, not just Dear Fortune, but Wilson Tudor Pole, Bly Bond, Alice Buckton. They're one bunch of characters and, and they, the culmination of everything that they were all about is, is with Dear Fortune and the visualisations that she engaged in um, through her correspondence with, with people in 1940. That's Glastonbury's finest hour, and everything that's in a period that takes about 50 years to play out from about 1890 onwards is all in what she does there. But you've also got the other side of the fence. Uh, what I, you know, what Dear Fortune didn't know, and I find this, you know, compelling and unusual. Glastonbury has its own theory of associations. This was brought out in those visualizations. Nobody really knew. The, the SS had their grown cars from Wavensburg. You know, and that in itself, the whole history of how that place even comes to be what it is, is also the culmination of 50 odd years involving a whole bunch of weird characters that will be out various sophists. So put the two together, you know, this is very, very intriguing to me. Over the course of writing this book, um, some real good resources came my way that it's good that I took so long to do it because when I started writing this, a lot of this stuff wasn't available. But the resource of Vinegar the Secret King, this has been around for a while, this is well worth checking out. But there's so much goddamn nonsense on the Thor Society, it was very, very refreshing to 
find a book that used historical sources of the German archives. Because those guys left a big paper trail behind them, and the history in itself is fascinating. And again, when it comes to the vexed topic of the Spear of Destiny, uh, this book is, is, is based on a whole series of interviews with a guy who was one of the so-called monuments men, who um, basically at the end of the war ended up in Nuremberg investigating the, uh, the relics of the Holy Roman Empire, including the Holy Logs. And there's a whole bunch of information there because he told his story um, in extensive tight interviews that actually gives some real information that Trevor Ravenscroft never even came to, that makes it absolutely clear that the top of the Nazi high rock did have a, a, a definite interest in the Holy Roman Empire regalia. But these are the two books that serve me the best. The master plan is, is an extensive trawl in the German archives. This is so important in recent years because people haven't been doing this. And you just get the same stuff recycled. A lot of stuff on the internet is, is, is appallingly unreliable. And, and in recent years, Eric Kurlander's Hitler's Monsters, which <coughs> was publicised quite a lot in, in 2017 when it came out. Although I'm not going to specifically talk about this, you know, as an example of how interesting this is, uh, the kind of information that you find in there, Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy was banned. Steiner was criticised and, and definitely, you know, persona non grata, but the actual techniques of biodynamic gardening were taken on board. All of the playing surfaces for the 1936 Olympics were prepared through biodynamic gold. How fucking crazy is that? This is the sort of information that is now coming to light out of German archives. That was freaking fascinating, man, it really was. And, and this absolute corker by Joseph Goldwyn, uh, Lance Disciples of Time, tremendously useful to me, and certainly in, in terms of what I'm going to engage in now. Now, yeah, I'm going to talk about the unfortunate villager, but for the sake of this audience, you know, I think you're going to, uh, you're better primed to appreciate certain nuances that have come to light that I've, I've engaged with in this book that are very, very important, in my opinion. We've got a central um, historical mystery. We start off with this guy, you know, very undistinguished First World War soldier. You wouldn't look twice at him in a gallery of a whole bunch of other First World War soldiers. Somewhere along the line, it doesn't take too long, something gets activated in him and people start paying attention to him. And before long, you know, he's become a bike man now. And, you know, he's, he's up close and personal with these people. You know, none of them are kind of recording in horror and finding him appallingly icky and weird. You know, we've got a whole retrospective on this, quite obviously, because how the history played out. But, you know, there he is, and something's been activated in him, some quality now. You know, the retrospective horror. I remember when I was, you know, back in university days, and you staying up pretty late with your mates and smoking a load of dope and talking a load of bollocks, two o'clock in the morning. Many of friends were having this conversation, what would be the thing that would freak you out the most? And the absolute undisputed winner, it wasn't some Lovecrafty and horror, you know, fantasy. If, what if you woke up in the middle of the night and found a sitting, sitting on the end of your bed, you know, and, and that, everybody just agreed that that would be, would be too much. And then it would be, well, what, are you do, what would you do about it? And one guy said he would just leap up and, and run him first and smash his head through the window and then twist his neck on the broken glass. And he would say, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Kind of sense of, of, of how we feel now, but you know, look at his phone, look at these people, and it's like it's not like it's a state an enormous stadium gig with all the special effects of you know, involved in music and hundreds of thousands of good stepping people. He's right up there close to what the hell has happened now. Kurlander's book pointed me in the direction of this incredible resource. This book here was private library. Here are a collection of 16,000 books, okay, and they all had this ex libris special stamp on them. Obviously, you didn't read all of them, but the fact is that people, if they wanted to give him a special present, like, you know, when he was in prison, uh, one of the Wagner family gave him a lavish edition of Goethe, you know, all this kind of stuff. 
And after the war, um, quite a lot of them found down a mine shaft, the you know, is gone, and there was even some found in the bunker that found their way back to America at an American university. And it's absolutely incredible because a lot of some of these books are annotated, they've got underlinings and all this sort of stuff. Some of you, if you've read The Spirit of Destiny, probably remember this story about supposedly what the Anna Stein, the anthroposophist, finds a, a, a second hand shop, an annotated copy of Wolf of an Ashbach's Parzival, and he realises all the writing on it is indicative of some fledgling addict of the Black Arms, and it turns out it's Hitler's. Now, this is like completely and utterly unverifiable, but in fact, we've got something that's come out of this this whole uh, search through the private library that's extraordinary. None of, of the great biographies of Hitler pay much attention to this stuff. It's extraordinary. Ian Kershaw is, is quite well known for a recent mammoth, you know, two volume biography of Hitler. He said, Well, you know, I saw some of this stuff, I didn't really look at it. This brings us to uh, the extraordinary Ernst Schertel. Now, Schertel's a kind of, um, he's, he's known for producing uh, an encyclopedia of, of sexuality that is very much a viable Republic thing. You know, this is stuff from the early 20s, and again, you know, it, it seems quite contemporary. It's the kind of stuff. Yeah, it's an illustration from one of his books. It is very, very far more republic, and he's, he's a guy who's um, uh, created experimental dance uh, true productions with atonal music. You know, he's got himself in trouble for espousing man or man love. You know, he's been booted out of some academic position for this. But he's also a kind of anthropologist and researcher into religion and mysticism. And he produces this book, um, you know, Magic History Theory and Practice, that's kind of a sort of familiar sounding title. This is 1923. And it's not a book that's like, if you think of, of the works of Olympus Levi or A.E. Way or Crowley, you've got Grimoire, sort of how to cast a circle in this and days and demons and correspondences and associations and so forth. It's not like that. It's, in many respects, a kind of a, a manual of self-intoxication, how to use posture and, and breathing to all that intoxicate yourself, how to get yourself into an altered state of consciousness. Now, the amazing thing is, you know, we think, okay, sure, all oh, inside the pages of Flash, all the, all the Weimar Republic stuff. Nonetheless, he signs a copy and dedicates it to Hitler and sends it to Hitler, and Hitler keeps his copy of this book. It's only about 140 pages long, and we're very fortunate there's a recent modern version of it. There are over 60 passages in this book where it has put a line down the side of the page. And this great edition that is now available actually gives you all of those passages in bold. So it enables you to kind of get a sense of, um, it's really 1923, now we don't know when Hitler read it. In my book, I found it very useful to place it in 1923 at the time of, of the Munich push. But in terms of the level of interest there, he who does not have the demonic seed within himself will never give birth to a magical world. This is a book that he has still got in the bunker and that he's made you know, annotations and underlinings with. Your God is both good and evil in appearance, and it cannot be otherwise. If your God is not even evil, it is just not God. God as the Almighty should also be all evil. And the real conquer for me, Satan is the creative value setting and value increasing principle, which at first always appears evil. Seraph, on the other hand, is the resting, preserving values affecting pole, which we call good. Satan is the fertilizing, destroying, constructing warrior. Seraph is possession and peace. Satan and Seraph are therefore not opposites, which one can tear apart, but they are pole notions which are only thinkable in each other and with each other. 
Satan is in everything that lives and appears. He acts in the last tenderest beam of light, the last star, before it is dissolving in the grey twilights of the worlds of finite, finite entropy. Now all of this stuff is emphasised by Hitler. And there's another little passage that I think, you know, I put a few quotes in the book as well that are not emphasised by Hitler. The darkness gives birth to the light and the gruesomeness to the blessedness. And, you know, Ronald was talking earlier about mystery cults. Uh, this is not actually highlighted there by Hitler, but this, uh, Schertel talks about after initiating the, the ancient mystery cults, when the aspirant will have undergone the intense old states by whatever means, the man afterwards is not the same as he was before. He's experienced a fundamental transformation because in him, the God center, the demonic center was opened. So that in a certain sense, he now appears as identical with his demon. That is to say, he himself appears as demon or God. And then emphasized by Hitler, the magician always appears antagonistic in the dominating time streams and is therefore always perceived as evil, but physiologically he appears as atavistic, like him, genius. Now I know a few of you um, saw me about five years ago um, talking about Crony and you and the Seven Servants of the Dead. This stuff, man, really, really reminds me of, of your Seven Servants of the Dead. You know, Braxus is undefinable life itself, which is the mother of good and evil and light. You know, this stuff has erupted in 1916. He's the, the highest light of day, the darkest night of, of madness. He's both the radiance and the dark shadow of man. And a praxis generates truth and falsehood, good and evil, light and darkness with the same word in the same deed. Therefore, a praxis is truly the terrible one. Now, what Shirt had known about Jung's text, it was not circulated widely, certainly not by 1923. There was an English version uh, presented in 1925 by Watkins, published anonymously as if by Basilides. What I prefer to think is that both of these texts are an, an expression, an eruption of the appalling, you know, state of, of the deep, deep shadow side of the collective European psyche in the midst of the wound of the Great War, which in Britain was experienced differently because of the fact that, you know, we're on the victorious side and there's a whole other spiritual mythology, angels of moms, British Israel, a whole bunch of stuff that's riding with us that I deal with in the book, but here you have this. And the thing that, you know, the very difficult truth, the thing that I've been contemplating, we have this sense of the Weimar Republic and the Nazis is kind of antithetical, the Weimar Republic is this extraordinary time of, of, of you know, creativity and freedom and expression and sexuality and in art and so forth, and then the Nazis come along and I trash that. My sense of, of, of this, with the figure of Schertel and this book and Hitler's response to it, is that they are, just like this Abraxas notices, one and the same thing. And, and that is a very difficult thing to contemplate. But also, you know, the main part of the presentation. The Germans were really big on Atlantis. Atlantology was a tremendous thing. Um, in the period between the wars, and particularly as the Nazi period gets going. Alfred Rosenberg was an early member of the Nazi party and has the very, very dubious distinction of having been the person who introduced the notorious protocols of the Elders of Zion um, into the Nazi circles around about 1919, 1920. Now he goes on um, to write in, and produced in 1930, this work, The Myth of the 20th Century, uh, which is absolutely enormous. Uh, it's a book that, on one level, was tremendously successful. It's supposed to have sold about a million copies, but people, even you know, the top Nazis, just found it so freaking boring they could barely bear to read it. But what it's got is a presentation of a huge great vision, an aristophical, aerialized vision of Atlantis. You know, and this is coming from somebody that, uh, who's like shoulder to shoulder with Hitler at the time of the Munich Putsch. This is somebody who later ends up going to the gallows at Nuremberg because of uh, 
the kind of uh, policies that some of the East Coast in the Eastern Territories during the terrible years from 1941 onwards. So, you know, Rosenberg talks about, you know, and so today, the long derived hypothesis becomes a probability, namely that from a northern centre of creation, which without postulating actual submerged Atlantic continent, we might call Atlantis, swarms of warriors once fanned out in obedience to the ever renewed and increased Nordic longing for distance to conquer and space to shape. Yeah, and he talks about from this northern, um, you know, uh, northern space of origin, they end up in the Mediterranean, they end up in Africa, they end up in China, they end up in North Africa, and, and, in, and in Palestine, where, you know, there's a whole thing that makes way for an increased sense that, that uh, the inhabitants of that area were uh, not just Semitic, but also area that Jesus could end up being an area and so forth. All of this stuff is, is kind of being disseminated at that time. That's Sir Worth. Now, Worth's very interesting because he is one of the founder members of the Almanac of the Notorious Ancestral Heritage Division. But what's really intriguing about Worth, um, first of all, uh, there's, a, there's an occasion, I think, about 1934, where he's introduced to Himmler and, and also to Colbert and Vinegar at the household um, of a couple the lady of which believes herself to be a reincarnated Bronze Age priestess, and she sort of wears this particular jewelry. You know, so there's a character like this uh, holding a kind of social circle in which Worth is already a famous Atlant, you know, Atlantologist and exponent of these things, is introduced to him, and, and he, you know, he plays it well and he becomes a strong associate. But Worth's very, you know, the very interesting thing about Worth is that Worth believes that the original Atlanteans were matriarchal and that they were ruled by you know, a bunch of psychic superwomen and uh, you know, they're at the roots of all of this. And in the 1930s, during the period of 1936, Nuremberg rallies, which you know, it's something that lasts about a week and it's not just all big stuff in stadiums, Hitler actually takes time out and he specifically speaks against this notion that the Aryans could possibly, you know, the, the pristine Aryans could possibly be matriarchal. So at this point, works out the job, and that whole kind of thing falls into a bias of Germany. But it is there, and obviously we'll be talking about how, you know, in Britain, with deal fortune, other sensibilities come to the fore. So this is where, you know, the whole, the black camelot, as we now, as we now call it, this is Weibersberg. This is the summation of 50 years' worth of strangeness. You know, we go back to people like Guido von Liszt, who, um, in a vision of experience in 1875, the Carl Lundsen and Gay has a vision of German history, has a period of time in the early 1900s where he, he has operations on his eyes, and he's, he's basically his eyes bandaged for a whole year. So he's like Botan, you know, hanging in the windy tree. He has all these clairvoyant vis visions of ancient German history, which is influenced by Blavatsky, which is influenced by all kinds of stuff about root bases and in immense periods of time. And And this is the kind of person who's lionised in Austrian society, particularly by people that are a high prestige. Now, the mayor of Vienna um, speaks out on his behalf. There's a list society. Um, you know, he's not a French crank. But the person who's, who's perhaps most important of this is, is, is the very strange Lance von Liebenfeld, Jürgen Lance von Liebenfeld, who had been a, a novitiate monk um, in an abbey and got himself into some very strange visionary states. He, produced a long-standing magazine called The Star that was published all through um, up to the First World War. Uh, it's quite feasible that Hitler might have, have seen this magazine. Liebenfeld's claim that he did. Uh, it seems feasible. The thing about Liebenfeld is he, he founds uh, an order of New Templars and a place called uh, Bergwerfenstein, which is on the Danube, 
uh, he, he, you know, he has rich banks and so on. He, he gets his cars for bikes and he, he gets this order um, instigated. On Christmas Day 1907, they raise a swastika flag from this place. And the things that they publish are basically all about very strict breeding regulations for Aryans. Women are just to become virtual slaves, just breeding stock. It's only, you know, white Germans will inherit the earth and everybody else is just basically going to be slaves. And he's got some absolutely barking mad stuff. He writes about in a book called Theos, Theos in Zoology, uh, the sides of the Solomite aplings and the divine electron. But basically, you know, in, in, in ancient times, uh, as well as, you know, the white Aryan super beings, there was this really degenerate race of kind of weird monkey animal type things, who nonetheless were irresistible sexual fodder. For some reason, the white Aryan super men just went to shake the arse with these things. And you know, you know, all these bastard, mongrel, hybrid, monster mutations that now polluted the earth, and not absolutely everybody, apart from white Germans, were somehow polluted by this. And we just had to sort this out, and just absolute genocide was the only way around it. So it seems kind of obvious that you've got a very weird ass template for what becomes um, SS policies. <laughs> so yeah, Babelsberg, you know, first and foremost, it is, you can't have it without the sheer power that this, you know, strange person behind the camera wields. Trevor Ravenscroft presents him as just some kind of empty shell inhabited by demonic forces. So I guess with the guy's track record, you know, you simply sort of have to um, pretty much accept that something like that is the case. He's a, a profound mystery. But the thing is, he's led to Babelsberg through his meeting with this guy, um, Karl Maria Villiger. Karl Maria Villiger, um, is another person like Guido von Nist who believes that his family history has gifted him with this clairvoyant ability. That he's the last in a line of seers that goes back hundreds of thousands of years, that he has profound knowledge of the secret history of the Germanic races, and that he is in fact the secret king of Germany itself. And in 19, um, 1924, um, you know, I introduced him at this point in my book in 1924, where basically um, he's sitting outside a cafe and a bunch of guys turn up in a car and bundle him off to a lunatic asylum at the behest of his wife, who basically considers him to be stark over mad and is also very concerned about the way in which he passionately kisses his daughters. There's something absolutely icky about this. So he's calling off. You know, to an insane asylum for three years, and, and he behaves pretty strangely there. He builds up an enormous, great collection of stones that he considers to be sacred relics. And there's like thousands of stones that he's collected from all around this place and put in his room. But he's carrying out correspondence with people all over Germany, and it's coherent enough to somehow recommend him to the Ariosophical people. And when he comes out of the asylum a few years later, uh, you know, people are seeking him out, they want to hear about him. And, and, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because there's no question that he's got some kind of charisma to him, that he is convincing that there is some kind of psychism going on there amongst all the all of the craziness. And one of Hitler's personal adjutants actually wrote an account of where Villiger turns up with a load of documents and maps and spreads his stuff out on Hitler's desk and talks to him about medieval prophecy about you know, a, a, a place that's going to be um, a fortress against an uh, attack from the east and so on. And, and he was already looking for a base and, and they narrowed down to a particular area. This is how they, how they end up with Weidensburg. And obviously, you know, this, this is part of the very strange contrast um, that, that goes into this wider story. The resources that these people have got are, are just you know, phenomenal. There's no limit to the resources they've got. Hitler was really creative for the accounting, you know, they just borrowed zillions from banks and just never paid it back. I mean, are you going to go, are you going to come to the SS and say, will you pay our money back, please? You know, it's like, they just do whatever they want. So the interiors, you know, we've probably seen all of this. It's incredibly lavish. All of these rooms are decorated in a particular style. And, and Villiger is actually the guy that is the person that supplies the style template 
you know, we have uh, available for hire out for marriages, you know. It also, it, you know, the notorious SS Briggs, he designs this stimulus teapot, by the way, which I think is a really <laughs> freaky artifact. I mean, it's quite nifty little really teapot, but when you think of maybe some of the conversations that were had whilst the tea was being pulled out of that teapot, it does um, make you feel a bit, a bit funny. Here's the famous, the famous design that's now just found its way all around the world, the so-called Black Sun in, in the Hall of Avonsburg. Now the idea was that they were going to have a round table there with a, a kind of circular opening that that was going to go over the top of. That never actually, they never got that far. They never got that far, but Vinegar is, is, is the man that supplies all of this and he's got this Amazing kind of pseudo history. Some of it seems to be ripped off getting all of this, some of it has obviously come via Blavatsky. But basically, you know, Atlanteans colonised Germany 200,000 years ago, and the Ligatan family, you know, dated from, from that particular time. And the New Testament story itself even had in Germany. You know, and, and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like this. And Jesus Christ was at his real name was Chris, and he was a divine incarnation who had originally founded a, a, a religion of, of, of Atlantean colonists back in 12,500 BC, and then he came back again, and, and so on and so forth. So he's actually thinking that he's kind of uh, propagating a sort of revived theory of Christianity. And here, of course, the notorious you know, one of the most increasingly sort of famous locations. Now, very interesting, the, uh, the notorious white volcano of Temple of uh, as some of you probably know, uh, when he managed to find his way to Wavensburg and they let him spend a bit of time in the crypt back in October 1982, and this is enshrined as the so-called Wavensburg working. And what he had to say, I think, is very interesting because he said, because he stood down in there in that crypt, and he said it was like a, a Krell machine. Uh, you're probably all familiar with this imagery from the sci-fi classic, uh, Forbidden Planet. You know, the technology of this, this lost race that enabled, uh, enabled their, their minds to manifest, and I hope that this would create a new golden age for them, but they had not banked on the monsters from the image, the shadow forms that came up and erupted and destroyed their entire civilization in one night. So, the tower, the North Tower of Wavensburg and the legendary crypt, which has got all kinds of really acoustical properties, and you know, a Keno felt that basically it was a Krell machine, and they didn't really understand what the hell was going on with it, and the monsters that erupted from the ears obviously led to their downfall. It's also intriguing, this is uh, Sina Shrek, Sina Shrek has uh, got, got herself into Wavensburg in 1992, and the mudra, the posture that she's assuming there is, is the form of a chalice. And she seems to be following up on some of these hints about um, the feminine side of the Atlantean mysteries and the Aryan mysteries, if you like, in Germany at that time, uh, in the 30s. But it's difficult to find out quite what she was, she was fully up to because the account she wrote there is, is only for people who are, you know, subscribe to a particular organisation. But it's intriguing stuff that basically you've got um, a, a very distinct female form there. And there was actually, you know, I can't go into this and I don't really talk about it in the book, but if you read Hitler's Monsters, there was a witchcraft division in the, S, in the SS. You know, they collected enormous amounts of information on witchcraft and female magic. There were had actually been witches um, imprisoned and killed in Wagensburg in the Middle Ages. And, and uh, Himmler considered this to be a travesty, that this was all wrong because of the fact that, you know, they would have been good at breeding machines. But he has this good se this sense that there is powerful magic in the witches that they should have been preserved. So again, there's, there are nuances there when you compare this to what's going on over here. And this is where it kind of gets surreal because one of the things that's great about Powell's and Bergier is that the, the, with all this extraordinary information and, and disinformation that they provide, they do actually say what, what is most important is that it was the ordinary people that got the better of the Nazis in the end. For all their sort of Superman uh, attempts, you know, to, to mutate into a, some evolutionary further form of humanity, for all that grandiosity, it's actually the everyday people, the straightforward people that are actually the ones 
the, the problem down. So I asked Neil Fulcher, you know, and, and, and Charles Thomas Lovedale, and they're on the other side, they don't even know about Vivensburg. Nobody knew about Vivensburg. British intelligence didn't know about Vivensburg until after the war. But they're on the other side of this divide, at the end of the hall. You know, they haven't got, they haven't got some massive resources. They're the Chinese Orchard Club for heaven's sake, you know. They've just got some like hammock stuff between trays and a few little lanterns in the trays. And as a side story, your Uncle Frank and your Aunt Elsie just set you down to have a little snooze, but they try to visualise all this stuff. But what Reading and Trades know, just as with Vivensburg, you've got it, you know, the first thing you encounter is it's a grow castle and it's medieval imagery, stuff from the First Reich, the Holy Roman Empire period, all of that. But there's this Atlantean underline. So with Deal Fortune and the 1940 workings, you've also got, you know, you're visualising Arthur, you're visualising Merlin, you're thinking about Morgan the Fight. But Deal Fortune's got some very clear ideas about all of this. And if you know Avalon at the Heart, there's a, a chapter in there called Avalon and, and Atlantis, where she's very clear um, with the kind of sense of <coughs> was the sculpted form the terracy on Glastonbury Tour um, a, a memory of a prototype that was, uh, you know, on, on the island of Atlantis that was an early term prototype that this, this form was somehow taken out by colonists. And, and she writes very clearly in there that um, the various forms that we're familiar with have got this profound lineage. And from an early age, we know, you know, even from a childhood times, she's seeing these kind of visions, she's having these visionary experiences, and they particularly um, increase after the, the experience that she had in the Theosophical Society Library, the dream um, during the First World War, where she meets, you know, the masters, and a whole bunch of past life memories are activated in her, and in particular, all this Atlantic stuff. And this is like the there in the background, all through the 1920s and even further into the 1930s, and the whole way that the, the cosmology, if you like, of the, the society, the fraternity of the inner light, is formulated is the fact that it's got its roots in Atlantis. And so Arthur, you know, Arthur is not just one figure, one person, Arthur's a, a title, and this goes all the way back to Atlantis. Now, it's not that is this true. Because quite obviously to most of us, it's not true, but it's about an emotional tone that goes with it. It's about the sense of the activation of something really, really archaic through that um, particular archetype. And especially so with Merlin. You know, there is, in, in the wartime workings, when you, we're looking at the inside of Master Hunter War, it functions on multiple levels. It is Glastonbury Tour, the Hill of Vision. It's a place that's got our few associations because of Glastonbury. However, you know, tenuous we might feel them to be. It's part of the soul poetry of the place. There is an emotional tone that goes with it. It's also the Rosicrucian vault. It's the Rosicrucian mountain of initiation. But she's very clear, you know, she mentions in one of the wartime letters that Merlin is an Atlantean initiate. And she's already put out this whole uh, stuff in Avalon the Heart about the idea that somehow the tour conforms to an archetype of, a, of, a, of an Atlantean temple mountain. And as time goes on, of course, most of us probably know better than anything for the novels of Sea Priestess and Moon Magic. And in there, she activates this whole magical persona of herself as, as different versions of um, the old fury sorceress. You know, Morgana, Morgana the Fire, Lily the Fire Morgan now. What's really intriguing about this is, you know, she's bringing this forth in herself. She's quite clear now. We, we know from the stories that we're wandering about in London, down by the embankment, you know, Cloak and all the rest of it, that the character in Moon Magic, you know, of Lily the Fire Morgan is something that she, she tries to literally become that in terms of her magical. So she's stirring all this up now. In a glass of of the time, we've talked about the Avalonians, the start of all this, the, the blue glass bowl saga, I don't need to go too much into this, but a guy called John Goodchild, and they put the blue glass bowl into Brighton in the first place. He had a whole theory that there was a, a massive kind of um, influx of, of divine feminine culture from Ireland, 
and this was presided over by the High Queen, who was also an embodiment of the Mole Rig Gang, which is, you know, the battle goddess. And all of this permeates the Glastonbury of the Inn of the Equal Years. It's, it's there in the Avalon of the Hulk Mythos. Avalon of the Hulk Mythos. And when Deal Fortune, you know, there's a lot of things that happened in 1940 that I think, you know, people who are in the Deal Fortune would appreciate this. The magic works for most of these arguments has been activated in a certain way. Deal Fortune becomes the bad goddess, whether she even writes about it specifically or not. She is activated. You know, this archetype of the Atlantean priestess, Morgan, who is, as it, she goes through time, as she goes through different layers of culture that are all present in Glastonbury into, into that time, she activates the bad goddess. She is completely primed. And somehow or another, this prevails. What's, what's really, really strange? When he can have his enemies, he's, a, he's a, an alchemy, you know, he's a weirdo for all the many stories that are told about him. You know, there are people in the SS that don't like him. He's actually pensioned off, he's taken out of commission and loses his job, as it were, on August 28th, 1939. Now that's literally just a couple of days before the war starts. And it's as if, you know, the magical engine, if you like, that Vaywood's book could have been, is, is never fully activated on that level. The round table never ends up in place there. Uh, elsewhere in Germany, the, the Holy Lord, the Spirit of Destiny, is put into a secret bunker in February 1940 before the Battle of Britain has even, even begun. All of this is kind of powered down. But we get back onto the sense of perhaps, you know, where we're going into almost absurdly. Because, you know, clearly after 1940, the Battle of Britain, Britain appears to be all right, but 1941 is a disastrous year. We've still got the fall of Singapore. And let's not forget the little matter of what the hell happened to that in Russia and the Holocaust. You know, it's like, this is real, this is real stuff. And however much we can say, well, somehow the Avalon of the Heart prevailed over Weifelsburg on a magical level. What we do know, what we do know for sure, is that um, a week before the Nazi invasion of Russia, uh, there was a meeting of the top SS Himmler Hydrogen Company at Weifelsburg. They quite possibly met in the North Tower itself. And from what we know about it, they calmly accepted that 20 to 30 million people were probably going to die through starvation and the general whatever, and that was fine. They set themselves up for the Eastern Front. So the perverse ideology, the monsters from the East, have been fully activated there. And, you know, it's, it's obviously Russia that bears the full brunt of, of the physical you know, outcome of the war. But there is still a whole bunch of nuances in the air. And what I find really, really unbelievably fascinating, Karl Rea Villiger, you know, is pensioned off at the end of the war. Um, they let him, he's, they let, he's in Austria, they let him go back to Germany, but he doesn't, he can't end the Germany. He dies on January the 3rd, 1946. Now, Dean Fortune dies on you know, January the 8th, 1946. They both die in the same week. Now, some, you know, some audiences might just think, well, yes, yeah, so what? But I think there's a very mysterious nuance here, especially being as the spirit of destiny after all kinds of controversies about where it was going to be, because it was in Nuremberg, where it had been in the, the Middle Ages, eventually returns to Vienna on January 6, 1946, which is all of that in the same week. And that's why, that's why I finished my book, you know, the subtitle, 2946, because I feel that is a very resonant, mysterious time to actually read this saga. So it's my most booky book. Well, I've just read, I hope you buy it, and I hope to see some of you tonight. Uh, I'm going to carry on with some more personal stuff, though, but I think some of you will find quite truly interesting. Thank you for coming along and listening to all this. Obviously, my book's out there, I'm hanging about, I'm happy to chat with you all.